if you're going to cover something monumental, then you better do it justice. <sighs> Metroid. Okay, so let's get the obvious out of the way. I'm a Sega guy. Always have been. Always will be. I had a Mega Drive over the SNES and I even played a Master System before even knowing what an NES was. Either way, for me, when people go crazy about old school classic Nintendo franchises, I sadly don't have the same nostalgia. So when I go back and play games like GoldenEye, Ice Climbers, Yoshi's Island and Kid Icarus, sure I get a buzz, but obviously from a personal standpoint, these games are very much being looked at with a new age pair of eyes. Some don't make the cut, and others very much do. You know a game is worth its weight in gold when over 20 years later, it not only still impresses newcomers like myself, but it has also got me off my ass to discover so many other similar style games. Some of which have very easily become top 10 games of all time. And yes, this bad boy made the list. So, let's finally rip off the Metroid Band-Aid and jump into the deep end, because it brings me great pleasure to finally dig deep into this franchise and say... Join me as we take a look at what is possibly Nintendo's greatest franchise, the games, the development, the people behind them, and of course, the future of the Metroid series. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. Like I said, Super Metroid is a brilliant game, a game that I've now played several times through, and it's the sole reason I want to start collecting for the SNES, although weirdly I actually don't own this one yet, so um, if anyone's feeling generous then uh, <laughs> hook me up. Super Metroid without a doubt is the best game for the console in my opinion, and let's go a little further, probably one of the best games for the 16-bit era. But don't worry, I'm obviously not going to just cover this gem, we got plenty to cover before we look into that one. The reason I bring it up is because it's the game that made me want to create this script and look into even more Metroid goodness that I, as I already stated, completely missed out on due to my blurry blue past. But before looking into any of the games between Metroid and that sexy little teaser that made everyone lose their minds at E3 2017, I think we're in fact getting a little ahead of ourselves. So, let's go back to the beginning. Gunpei Yokoi. The more I talk about this company, the more I will talk about this guy. As we yet again find ourselves in 1965, where Gunpei just completed his degree in electronics at Doshisha University in Kyoto, Japan, and then pretty much instantly joined this fairly new company called Nintendo. However, this was a time before the likes of this, this, or even this, but instead stuff like this. But, as you all doubt probably know, as time went on, so did the company, and eventually the top dogs decided to put Mr. Yokoi at the forefront of the company's coin-op division. Now, as I've mentioned in previous videos, Nintendo's early arcade games pretty much all sucked. Nothing much apart from Sheriff really got the juices flowing, as Gunpei was busy doing other things. Legendary things. What things, I hear you ask? Well, how does the Game & Watch do it for you? Still not aroused? <laughs> then what about the Famicom? The Game Boy? The bloody Virtual Boy? Uh, okay, we'll leave that last one. Regardless, you can see why he was so bloody respected within these glorious red walls. As time went on and his fantastic track record continued, he was obviously getting himself more and more challenging responsibilities. And thankfully, one of those so-called responsibilities was looking over some of the upcoming games that would eventually refine the company. And you guessed it, Metroid was one of those games. 
This is where we get introduced to Yoshio Sakamoto, a game designer that had been with the company since 1982 and had already worked on such classics as Donkey Kong Jr, Balloon Fight, Wrecking Crew as well as being a director for Gumshoe. The two work together closely quite a bit and Sakamoto actually remembers regular brainstorming sessions with several other members of the team where they would try and work out the next big thing. If they couldn't think of anything, Gunpei would actually come up with the ideas himself. And a lot of the time, those ideas were very much trying to fill whatever void wasn't being looked at in those early days. But also, and more importantly for this episode, he often tried to regain interest in failing projects. And considering the Nintendo disc system wasn't exactly flying off the shelves, they decided to take advantage of the extra special space available on that bad boy and create two adventure games. A little game going by the name of The Legend of Zelda was first, which, in case you didn't know, turned out to be one of the company's most popular franchises. I'm serious, it's called The Legend of Zelda, apparently there's quite a few of them. If you haven't heard of it before, I suggest you put down your copy of Fantastic Dizzy and go and look it up. It's quite good, or so I've heard. Anyway, for that second game, Yoshio wanted to move away from the art style seen in so many other kiddified and cutesy looking games that were all the rage at the time, and ended up with the idea of making a gloopy alien-like world that felt alive. Haha, <laughs> no more simple coloured blocks and single coloured environments that other developers like Shigeru Miyamoto was pushing out. This game had to be something different. If Yoshio was going to be successful in creating a new video game, he had to break the mould and make something completely new that the world had never seen before. You see, Nintendo was still in its early days when developing these games, which is why there was such a massive variety in the style of games they were pumping out. How do you market something when you've got no idea who the audience will be? Well, by releasing quality titles that all play a little bit differently and are aimed at different age groups and Sakamoto's next game was most definitely going to be aimed at an older demographic. So with a thumbs up from Gunpei, Yoshio, Sakamoto and his new team of legendary Nintendo heroes such as composer Hirokazu Tanaka, and character and scenario designers Makata Kano and Hiroji Kiyotake, who all went ahead to pitch this gloopy alien world video game simply titled, <laughs> nope. Space Hunters. Wait, what? Space Hunters? Yep, the game was originally going to be called Space Hunters and not Metroid. In fact, you can still see the name being referenced in the game's manual. Like I said, Gunpei wanted the team to create something that hadn't been done before and shortly after a platforming demo that rewarded exploration rather than simply just going right was made and before the team even knew what they were going to do with it moving forward, a deadline was set by Nintendo and development began. Pretty much everything you see when you play a Metroid game nowadays started here. The team were quite worried about the mammoth task ahead and decided to call an emergency meeting to work out exactly what they needed to do. And it was within this short emergency meeting that a lot of those famous features we are all too familiar with in the Metroid universe were made up on the spot over a cup of coffee and were quickly put together with no real hesitation due to the time frame. We weren't able to increase the amount of memory we had for the game and we were not allowed to make major changes to the core engine, but we had freedom in terms of game structure. In a way, we were stuck, stuck between high walls and we had to think of a way out. This is the feeling we also put in the game. Maybe you could blast a little hole in the wall. This might lead you to another room or corridor and this is how the basic structure of the game came about. This is a perfect example of a publisher giving restrictions that actually benefit the final game. But where do they get their inspiration from? Well, I think that is pretty obvious.
the classic Alien movie, or at least the style of that film, which was created by the amazing H.R. Giga, was an enormous inspiration which Yoshio has confirmed countless times. In fact, as this video goes on, you'll no doubt come across quite a few similarities between the style of these Metroid games and the Alien series that are so close they will give Donkey Kong and King Kong a run for their damsels in distress. I think the film Alien had a huge influence on the production of the first Metroid game. All of the team members were affected by H.R. Giger's design work, and I think they were aware that such designs would be a good match for the Metroid world we had already put in place. During development, the team thought that the Space Hunter was way too slow and decided to speed her up, but this became uncontrollable. They fixed this issue by creating longer corridors and taller rooms resulting in a style that has stuck with the 2D style of the series ever since. It's safe to say that the team, even with their short deadline, quickly worked out exactly what they needed to do, and a short nine and a bit months later, we finally got Metroid. Why Metroid and not Space Hunter? Well that's actually quite a weird one. The name Metroid isn't named after this thing. Well. Sure, that's what it's called, but instead the origin of the word Metroid actually was a mix between Metro, as in the subway system, and Android. Pretty strange, sure, but hey, it works perfectly. As for the name Samus Aran, well that's even stranger. Apparently Samus Aran was named after Pelé, the Brazilian soccer player. Samus Arente Nascimento. And... If you want to dig even deeper, Samus, who was modelled after Kim Basinger, wasn't a female during development. Nope. It wasn't until halfway through development when the development team thought, hey, wouldn't it be kind of cool if it turned out that this person inside the suit was a woman? Although she was actually referred to as a he in the instruction booklet, but that may have been a cover up from one of the greatest reveals in gaming history. Wow. That's a lot of random facts thrown your way. I think it's about time we look at the game. The challenge is Metroid. The power is Nintendo. Defend the planet Zephus against the evil Mother Brain. It's survival or destruction. Do battle or die. Metroid only from Nintendo. <laughs> ステイ深く広がるメール要塞に宇宙征服の野望が渦巻く。行け、宇宙戦士サムス。ファミリーコンピューターディスクカードにアクションメールゲーム。メトロイド。やればやるほどディスクシステム。How bloody awesome are those adverts? In fact, one of the awesome things about this whole Metroid series are the adverts, so expect to see plenty more as this video goes on. Anyway, the original game. Let's take nostalgia out of it and look at Metroid through the eyes of those that played it towards the end of the 80s when space movies were at the top of their game. Metroid is something incredibly special and is one of the many perfect examples of Nintendo not only giving us something new, but more importantly, grabbing you and taking you on an adventure the same way those classic movies were doing at the time. Sure, looking back now, it's hard to perhaps see this with games like Gears of War and Uncharted doing the work for us. And honestly, I'm not taking anything away from those games. I bloody love them. But a game like this with its atmospheric music, its brilliant art style and overall feeling of loneliness on a planet that isn't your own really did help your imagination go wild. I've said it before and I'll say it again. A good game is a good game despite its graphical capabilities. And when a good game looks like this, for me it's the perfect middle ground between a movie and a book. It takes you on a fantastic journey and gives you just enough visual aids to let your mind fill in the rest. Now, I'm not going to talk about the story in all of these games in the Metroid franchise, it will be here all bloody day. Plus, it's best you go and experience them for yourself, especially those later ones. But as this is the first, let me give you a brief rundown. 
It's the year 20X5, and space pirates have attacked the Galactic Federation-owned space research vessel and sea samples of the Metroid creatures, which are parasitic life forms discovered on the planet SR388, and not the name of the main character, which I'm sure plenty of kids back in the day thought was the case. Metroids are these things, floating organisms that attach onto living things and suck the life out of them. <laughs> nice. The plan by the space pirates is to replicate them and use them as weapons. When the Galactic Federation locates the space pirates, they send in you, Samus Aran, to save the day and destroy Mother Brain, a biomechanical life form that controls the bad guys. This game is a Metroidvania style game, obviously, and it requires you to explore the world rather than just simply running through it. Every so often you're going to find yourself at a dead end which requires you to go back and look around a little bit more. And you soon realise that the more you explore, the more you're going to be rewarded. Spending ages scratching your head on what to do next is always paid off when you finally find a power up that lets you jump higher, or another that lets you open certain doors that you wasn't able to go through before. During your playthrough you will find yourself searching the whole map several times until you know it like the back of your arm cannon. Which, I suppose may sound boring as all hell. But like I said, it's the eerie vibe that the game greets you with that really does keep you going. Is Metroid a good game? <laughs> yes, of course it is. It's a bloody legendary game. However, when you take off your 1980s shades, you do see that the game has aged somewhat. It's not bad. Of course it's not. It's just the Metroidvania genre, especially those later Metroid games, did it so much better than this one. So much so that if you have played those later games, you may find it a little hard to go back and play this original. But, really, that's all the negativity I have for the game. Of course the game has aged somewhat. It's over 30 years old. But if you are a fan of the series and have not played this one, then I urge you to go and try it. You will love it. And hey, if you're not a fan of Metroid, why are you even watching this video? Here, take this hot knife and bugger off. As most of you already know, that original Metroid game eventually moved from the Famicom Disk System to the NES just one year later where it was played by so many more people. And the main difference between them was that the Famicom Disk System version used a free slot save system and the cartridge used a 24 character long password system. Metroid is one of those early instances of a Japanese created video game being made using influences outside of Japan, which is the main reason that Metroid did pretty well over here and not that great over there. Which is why the sequel came out in America first. <laughs> yep, Japan had to wait a whole six years before the sequel was released, whereas Americans only had to wait four years. So it's time for Japan to ramp up their marketing for the Metroid brand, and if you ask me, they did it brilliantly with the advert used to promote the game. <laughs> well, better than America did anyway. Hi Game Boy! アメリカで人気抜群のアクションソフトメトロイド2を紹介しようあのメトロイドがグーンとパワーアップして相手に充実的キャラだって最高にエクサイティングゲームボーイソフトメトロイド2メトロイド。Be afraid, be very afraid. One life-sucking Metroid survived the first Metroid adventure, and it's multiplying rapidly. You must help Samus save the universe again in Metroid 2. So we're giving you more power and mightier weapons to search a bigger world where hundreds of strange enemy life forms lurk. Destroy or be destroyed. Metroid 2, the return of Samus, only on Game Boy. The future is in your hands. This is Metroid 2 Return of Samus, the first ever handheld Metroid video game, released on the Game Boy in 1992 in Japan and a couple of months earlier in 1991 in North America. Gunpei Yokoi yet again was producing the game 
and only a couple of years prior had released what is arguably the most iconic handheld of all time. And this game is seriously one of the system's highlights. <laughs> yes, I am a fan. Now despite its single coloured graphics which work way better on the Game Boy Colour, oh and by the way Nintendo even put some coding which is known as the Metroid palette into the Game Boy Colour to make sure that this game would look its absolute best, so go and play it on that. Regardless whatever system you play it on, it's still very easy to work out what you're doing. The team really had to push that original Game Boy to its limits for this game. And due to its single colour display, a few bells and whistles were added to help differentiate the different types of suits you wear when playing the game. Some of these designs have actually now become a staple of the series ever since. There are a few tweaks added to your power-ups as well as a few new ones that also keep coming back in many of the games after this. Now the game itself, even though I'm a big fan, is loved by some and meh, by others. Whereas the first game was a very Metroidvania game, again, obviously, this one isn't as much, and your goal is to destroy all of the Metroids, and you can see how many you've got left by looking at the countdown in the corner. You see the big difference here is that the majority of your path is blocked by hot lava that can only be passed when you kill enough of these Metroids as it somehow causes an earthquake which lowers the lava level letting you move to different sections. It's not as big but on the flip side it's not as cryptic either. As you may have guessed I fell into the I like it style of gamer and still think it's well worth playing regardless of which style of Metroid you prefer. Sure the lack of much of a soundtrack is a tad upsetting, but for a Game Boy game, following on from this, damn, colour me impressed. Now this is the point of the video where I need to show off this bad boy. But you know what, I'm not going to do that, well not yet anyway, let's have a ganders at this instead. As impressive as another Metroid 2 remake is, and it really, really is, it's freaking hard. And sadly, this is the one thing that stops it from being probably one of the best versions of the game. However, if you are a hardcore fan of this game, I can understand why it is loved so bloody much. Several new abilities have been added, there's a lovely map now, and well, just look at it. After seeing what is possibly the best looking 2D Metroid game ever in my opinion, I was left feeling a little gutted when I heard Nintendo decided to go for a 2.5D approach with their remake. But hey, at least developer Dr. M64 seemed to like the look of it. In case you don't know, AM2R is a fan game. A fan game for the Metroid community that is probably the equivalent of Streets of Rage Remake or Sonic Mega Mix. It spent 10 years in development and when it was eventually released for free to download, the internet showered the game with almost complete praise. Then, a few days later, Nintendo slapped the dev with a DMCA notice to take it down. I'm not exactly sure why Nintendo didn't stop the game sooner considering it was talked about for many many years, but I do understand why they did it. <laughs> Hello? Thankfully however, the game was available to download in its completed form for at least a couple of days. And as you know, when something enters the internet, no matter how many DMCA's get thrown at it, it's never going away. Interested in this game? <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell you where or how to download it, but what I will say is that it's very, very easy to find. Oh. A quick side note, Dr. M64 aka Milton Guasti has now signed on to work at Moon Studios on the next instalment in the Ori franchise, which is a follow up to my all time favourite Metroidvania game. So for me at least it worked out alright in the end. Right anyway, let's take a brief look at Metroid Samus Returns shall we? I am very, very similar to a lot of you guys out there. The Prime games are good, well actually they're bloody great, and we will get to those soon. But what I really wanted was a true new 2D adventure. Sadly, this is what I got. 
I'm not saying the game is bad, of course I'm not. But straight away after hearing about it at E3, it did grind two very big gears for me. Firstly, it's not 2D. Sorry guys, but I think this looks way, way nicer. And secondly, it's not a new game. Regardless of these minor hiccups, the game is still great fun. Obviously it is. It's Metroid. It's not what I wanted, but it's still really enjoyable. The controls feel far more fluid than the original handheld, and honestly, if I wasn't told that this was a remake, it would take me a while before I worked it out. It does feel like its own game, and it almost is. The presentation is also a lot better than you would originally think, and although I prefer the sprite style work found here, you quickly get used to it. And honestly, it actually does look really good. Look, whatever version you decide to get, you've got a good game. One of the best in the series in my unpopular opinion. But it's not the best. Oh no. The very best Metroid is one of the very best games ever made, period. There is a reason the world goes crazy for Super Metroid. And as you are about to see, there's a bloody good reason for it. It's time for Sakamoto to return. Although Metroid has its fans and critical acclaim, it also has its haters. And for Samus' second outing on a console, the big end decided to take the series back to its explorational, fully Metroidvania style roots. It was actually producer Makoto Kano that went to Yoshio Sakamoto and explained how big the original games were in North America and convinced him to work on a new game for Nintendo's newest system. When it came to making another sequel, this time for the Super Famicom, we really wanted to see how far we could push the Super Famicom to generate greater power of expression and enhance the appearance of the game world, all while working with a basically unchanged concept. That was our initial motivation as far as Super Metroid was concerned, to build on the expressiveness of Metroid 2 and achieve greater presence, something closer to a reality. Thankfully the story of Metroid continues after the surprise ending to Metroid 2. I'll let you guys go and look it up if you want it spoiled, and although some may say Metroid 2 is a tad forgettable in the storyline department other than the important thing that happened in its ending sequence, Yoshio seemed to like it and used it to continue expanding the story of Metroid in Super Metroid. I suppose all you really need to know is something happens with some Metroids and Samus' arch enemy Ridley has fled to another planet which obviously means you have to go search this new planet and do the typical Metroid thing once again. During the game's early stages of development, Kano and Sakamoto knew they had a lot more power under the hood compared to the first system. So, they went to Nintendo's Intelligent Systems division, who was already versed with exactly what the Super Famicom could do with titles such as Metal Combat, Falcon's Revenge, and Fire Emblem, Mystery of the Emblem. Thankfully, at this point in the system's life, all the different developers' teams were still finding new ways of pushing the system to its limits, and obviously Super Metroid was a prime example of going further than anyone had ever expected. Now, like I said, Sakamoto was the main guy on the project, but you will be surprised to hear that only two more members of that original game's team joined him. And instead, the vast majority of Super Metroid's development team were made up of graduates, some of which were putting out their very first game. Sakamoto remembers the development process being very strict. If you think a game like Metroid was hard to make, try making a sequel for the 16-bit system. More sprites were needed, more artwork was constantly being made, so much so that at one point, the entire team ended up being tasked with creating imagery for the game. However, this ended up not working out for the game, as the final result was an absurd mishmash of styles that just didn't fit. Because of this, the team had no choice but to redo the whole lot, which, as you may have guessed, pushed the development process back once again. 
and according to an interview with Sakamoto, the final months working on the game became quite unbearable. The Nintendo building became like a boarding house for the Super Metroid team. It got to the stage where I really don't remember going home at all. There was a nap room where it was okay to sleep, but sometimes it was full of other Super Metroid team members. Those were the worst times, when I wanted to sleep but couldn't and I didn't have time to go home. There were always between 10 and 15 of us in the office through the night, so we had to take naps in turns. The nap room wasn't being cleaned or looked after at all, because we were always using it. One morning, staff from another area came to wake us up and told us the room smelled like a zoo. Another Nintendo employee put a room freshener in the nap room, but that only made the place pong even worse. Everyone in Nintendo gave us funny looks. Thankfully, the whole process paid off, as these eager new recruits really did put their all into the game, creating something that is so goddamn popular, it's noted as being one of the most influential video games of all time. Even Gunpei Yokoi, who was the project manager, was during its development getting more and more wound up with how the game was being made, and how it was past its deadline. Well, even he was eventually crazily happy with the final product, so much so that he would constantly play it and compare all future games to that of Super Metroid. In fact, if another action-based game was presented to him that didn't meet his expectations, he would order the team to go away and play this. In my very popular opinion, and I'm sure this will come to absolutely no surprise to anybody out there, this game is the best game in the series, and the very best game on the system. Although, if I'm going to be honest, I did originally play it on the virtual console, but hey, whatever. Everything from the moody music and the brilliant opening helps shape the story, and even though I'm not a big story type guy when it comes to video games, hence why I'm not a big fan of RPGs, the way that Super Metroid does it is quite brilliant. After that short intro, you, the player, work it all out for yourself. And although sometimes there can be some pretty big gaps in the storyline whilst you explore the world, when something does happen, it constantly makes you go, ah. The game was made this way. It's one of those rare games that doesn't hold your hand when you discover a new story element or gain a new ability. It just makes you look at previously visited areas completely differently. And when you do, you'll feel more rewarded than ever. This is exactly what the team developing it was going for, and they nailed it. And I know I say it quite a lot on my channel because, well, I like reviewing outstanding games, but go and play this game. It's one of the most essential plays of all time, especially on a Nintendo system, and obviously because it's on a Nintendo system, there's no excuse not to. You can get the game on the virtual console for a few quid, and let's not forget this little thing. However you want to do it, in the words of everyone's favorite washed up celebrity, just do it. And if it just so happens to be your first time ever playing a Metroid game, <laughs> Then welcome to the club. これがメトロイド。まだ幼虫だ。しかしこのエネルギーは人類の役に立つかもしれん。あ、ベビーメトロイドが奪われる。緊急試練。スペースハンターサムスアラン。さらわれたベビーメトロイドを奪い返す。ス
years until Nintendo released the fourth game titled Metroid Fusion for the Game Boy Advance. Boy I do love that handheld. It was so strange that the N64 went its entire life without Metroid other than the obvious Smash Brothers appearance, but hey, that's Nintendo being Nintendo am I right? Metroid Fusion was yet again released in North America first on November 18th 2002 and was actually released at the same time as the Gamecube game Metroid Prime, but we'll get to those Prime games in a little bit. Yet again the game shortly after starting finds a way of putting you on a planet with limited abilities that you have to gain from exploration which helps open up other sections. It's a 2D Metroid game, you know how it goes. Is it a good game? Hell yes, and I sadly only very recently played this game, as for me, and I'm sure plenty of others watching too, this game was just completely overshadowed by the amazing Metroid Prime, and because of this the idea of a 2D Metroid game instead of this incredible work of art, <laughs> it just wasn't of interest. Perhaps things would have been different if I saw the amazing advertisements for the game. Game Boy Advance ミチの生物Xによって体を蝕まれたサムス。一命は取り留めたが、その代償は大きかった。ゲームボーイアドバンスメトロイドフュージョン。Exterminating evil gives you strength, but are you strong enough to face your greatest fear? Metroid Fusion, only on Game Boy Advance. Rated E for everyone. You gotta give it to the Metroid series. Four great games so far, with bloody awesome adverts too. The reason the Metroid Fusion plays so well is because that original team, or at least the majority of that original team, was yet again working on the game. A large majority of the assets used on Super Metroid are used here. Even the majority of the music for the game was taken from that Super Nintendo classic game and rearranged for this one. It's obvious to all, if you like this, you're gonna like this. Plus, if you play with your headphones on, this one is actually, in my opinion, one of the scariest games in the whole series. I don't want to show you too much here, but this game had several moments that genuinely did make me jump. If you're looking for a game that is perhaps slightly easier than Super Metroid, a lot less explorational and a lot more run and gun like, then Metroid Fusion will do you proud. Plus, I am torn between whether I prefer the animated cutscenes found in this over Super Metroid. <laughs> Either way, it's a very welcome addition in my book. And one of the very best games for that system too. Damn, that's four brilliant games now. And thankfully, gamers didn't have to wait much longer, as only two years later Metroid Zero Mission was released. Again, on the Game Boy Advance. Now kids, you might want to ask your mummy to leave the room. You're about to feel things that you may have never felt before. Cue those ad breaks. In a blur of raw talent and courage, a life's mission begins. You can experience it as Samus in Metroid Zero Mission. Her first adventure as an intergalactic bounty hunter. Rated E for everyone. Remember when I said that original Metroid was released on the Game Boy Advance? Well, here it is. If you're jumping into the Metroid 2D series for the very first time, then perhaps this is the best place to start. It's a remake of the original game. 
Everything from that first game is here and then some. Not only is the entire game replicated, they've even added whole new areas and plenty of new bosses. One of the best things about the game is not only the awesome new Super Metroid style look and feel of the classic NES game that by comparison looks bland and boring, but it's the ending. Even if you've played this game, it is still fully worth playing this one. The huge twist that comes at the end, which again I'm not going to spoil here, makes the whole thing worth playing through again. Metroid Zero Mission comes very close to yet again being one of the best 2D Metroid games, mainly because it's just so easy to pick up and play compared to the others. With so many great games, how do you think they ended these non-Prime games? <laughs> you all know where this is going. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my displeasure to showcase Metroid Other M. Oh boy, what a massive shame. This game had so much potential, and I'm sure it's the same for so many others watching this, but I was super excited for this game. Metroid Other M, even with all the hate you hear, actually does have some brilliant ideas. Yep, you heard me correctly. And no, I'm not talking about those game adverts, which we'll get to in a minute. Although, at the time of its release, I was so disappointed with the game that I quickly sent it back to the shops. However, I did buy it again, and playing it back now, I can actually see what they was trying to do. Metroid Other M is almost a good game, and sadly, that's the best I can do. Now, like I've said many times on this show, heavy story-based games are not my thing. Hence why I've been such a fan of the series up to this point. If you really want to take your time finding out the backstory, you can. But for me, the tiny little injections of stories scattered throughout make Metroid what it is. Something that you can discover on your own time. And something you understand and work out whilst you're on that journey. Metroid Other M does not do this. The story and its cutscenes are overlong and super boring. Especially for a gamer like me. And the gameplay, although similar to what has happened in the past, after all this came out after the Prime games, is incredibly linear. Sure, you got yourself a nice little map again, but there really is only one way to go, and it's slapped all over your face, which means exploring the world this time just doesn't happen often at all. Now, like I said, the game isn't all that bad, and I can continue going on about some of the game's awful choices. But honestly, take all that crap out of it, and there is actual enjoyment to have with the game hidden deep, deep inside. The controls are actually, well, they're not too bad once you get used to them. And if games like Ninja Gaiden are more your cup of tea, and your expectations on what a Metroid game is are currently thrown out of the window, then you probably will find some enjoyment. And I'll tell you now, when searching around online, you will be surprised to hear that there is actually some hardcore lovers of this game. If you think it's universally hated, then you are wrong. A small majority of people really do like Other M, and it's not just because of the amazing advert promoting it. My past is not a memory. It's a force at my back. It pushes and steers. I may not always like where it leads me, but like any story, the past needs resolution. What's past is prologue. あれからどれくらい経ったのだろうか。幼くして両親を失った私は常に意地を張り心を閉ざした。いろんはないなレディ。待ってくれ、ダブ。ぶっ下げ時間を与えないか。私は幼すぎた。なんで親って。あまりに
アザーエンファミコンのメトロイドが最新技術のファミコンゲームメトロイドアザーエムメトロイドオモロイド You'll be surprised to hear that Sakamoto and the team behind those original games, minus number two of course, were behind this one too. But to help them turn the 2D classic into a 3D game, they got the help of an outside company known as Team Ninja, hence the nod to Ninja Gaiden. They also got hold of D Rockets, however, their job was simply to create the cutscenes, which, by the way, I personally don't really care for in a Metroid game. However, I can't take away from the fact that they do look absolutely stunning. Team Ninja most definitely took the project on with a crazy amount of passion as they were big fans of the series up to this point. And when Sakamoto joined the team, one of the first things they looked at was making sure the game had a heavy emphasis on story. He was worried that those blasted Prime games had given people a different opinion on who Samus Aran was, and he wanted to change that. On top of this, he also wanted to make sure that the game was simple to control, stated that he wanted the controls to be as simple as an NES game. Team Ninja agreed, and that's why the game is controlled entirely by using nothing but the Wiimote. This was a huge mistake, if you ask me. Adding that nunchuck would have really helped. Regardless, during the game's three year production, including a whole year just for the voice recording sessions, which, by the way, when listening back, it's hard to understand exactly what was happening in that sound department because, well, it's really not that good. It was the first joint mission I'd been a part of since becoming a freelance bounty hunter. And of course, it was the first time since my Federation days that I was following the orders of a commanding officer. What we ended up getting was a pretty heavy, hard and still galvanized nail smashed directly into the Metroid coffin that sadly put a lot of people off the series for a very long time, Nintendo included. But, like I said, while Sakamoto and his crazy combo team was working on the most recent game in the main series up to that point, there was another team, One Retro Studios, taking on the Metroid name, and as you know, they had a far greater success with their trilogy of games. GameCube. Me ni mie eru mono dake o shinjiru na. The cold silence of space only punctuates the feeling of death that emanates from this virtually lifeless planet. Only one thing is alive and well here. Evil. And it must be destroyed. Decimated. Exterminated. But first, it must be found. Metroid Prime was one of the first console based first person shooters that I fell in love with, and to this day, possibly still the best. Well, it's bloody close. Metroid Prime was created by Retro Studios and heavily influenced this time by none other than Mr. Shigeru Miyamoto. Now, at the time, CEO of Retro, one Michael Kelbar, remembers the whole situation quite intimidating for the small studio. Not only is Retro Studio pretty much brand new, made up mostly of former Iguana Entertainment staff, 
but they're taking the beloved Metroid series and making the developers sin of moving it in a completely different direction. A direction that at first, honestly, seemed a bit crappy. I mean, come on, how dare they modernise such a perfect genre-defining formula, am I right? The fans have been begging for a new Metroid game since the days of Super Metroid, and was teased several times with name drops during the life of the N64. I know that the American people have been eagerly anticipating a new Metroid game. I've been asked about it many times. Even through the entire Nintendo 64 period, we were thinking of a way to produce a new Metroid title. We couldn't come up with any concrete ideas or vehicle at the time. When I met the retro team and saw the work they were doing, I thought that this was the kind of team that could work on a Metroid game. The time has finally come to make the classic 2D Metroid games 3D, and for Nintendo to take first person shooter games very seriously. Now, one of the things Miyamoto did put forward to the team at Retro was the importance of the Morph Ball transitions. Everyone knew that the almost third person Monkey Ball style ball sections would be a tough transition from a first person perspective, and if the team couldn't work it out then the whole project would be canned. Seriously, it was pretty much the first directive put forward. If Retro Studios couldn't get the transitions to work, then the game wasn't going to happen. Thankfully. Shigzi chose the right people for the job and as you all know, those transitions are smooth as silk. Shigeru Miyamoto and Nintendo as a whole were very intimidating, but thankfully, it was for the best and those big challenges that the big end pushed onto Retro ended up making them what they are today, a bloody awesome dev team. In fact, the terrifying relationship actually started long before the game went into production, when Mark Pacini, the director of the game, had his first initial meeting with Miyamoto and co to discuss Metroid Prime, to then find out that Nintendo was unhappy with the discussion as they did not feel he was listening, because he didn't bring a pen or a pad to the meeting. Anyway, another one of the big changes for the company was platforming. The Metroid games up to this point are basically perfect platformers, and the majority of first person shooters up to this point were not. As you know, they perfected this too. It was a tough process of trial and error, but again, they sussed it out, making sure that the camera moves slightly downwards at the end of a jump to make it feel more fluid, as well as making sure that the jumps themselves were all completely reachable. Unless, of course, they were designed to purposely be out of reach. All of this made the game feel natural rather than a platformer's nightmare. In Lowe's games, our primary consideration was player movement and jumping in the environment so that they could more easily explore it. Shooting was a very important, though, secondary consideration. In the end, even though the game was pretty much fully made by the retro team, it was very much a collaboration effort and after reading several interviews with people that worked on it, they all seemed to agree the game wouldn't have been anywhere near as good without this collaboration. A good example of this is Retro's early vision of making Metroid Prime pretty much an action-adventure game, and not much more. It was only when co-producer Kensuke Tanabe from Nintendo of Japan suggested that the visor, which was very bare bones at this point in development, should be used to scan the environment, which in turn will work as a story and a tutorial. This is when the game really started to feel unique. Even Shigeru Miyamoto is also credited for the visor system, when he said in an early meeting, What would it be like if Samus had a bug's head? Which, although, as I'm sure you'll expect, was confusing at first, made absolute sense when you look at all the different visors used to solve puzzle elements in the game. Eventually, all this back and forth between the American Game Studio and Nintendo of Japan led to the release of this fantastic game worldwide on November 17th, 2002. To say this game was a success is a serious understatement. Not only did it win several Game of the Year awards to this very day, it is still classed as one of the greatest games ever made. And although the occasional person may have moaned about the strange use of first person controls that felt slightly <coughs> alien compared to what they may have been used to up to this point, in my opinion, shortly after playing they feel completely natural on what is possibly one of the greatest controllers ever made. And hey, if you still prefer typical first person controls, then the version found on the Metroid Trilogy Pack should fix that issue. Regardless, whatever version you decide to get, well, let me put it this way, 
I haven't found anybody that doesn't like this game yet. Comment section, bring it on. Even the GameCube version, which is two generations old at this point, still looks amazing. The atmosphere and the music presented here can't help but pull you in. And yes, there is backtracking, but seriously, if that is actually an issue, then why are you playing Metroidvania games? By this point, you know how it goes. You have all your abilities, you lose all your abilities, you gradually regain all your abilities through exploring the world around you, and eventually complete your objective whilst making it out just in the nick of time. It's no different here than any other game, and if you like games like this, as well as atmospheric first person shooters like this, with a dash of classic Zelda like puzzles, then this is the perfect game for you. And, once that game came out, as you would expect, Nintendo was loving the reception it was getting. And obviously, only two years later, a sequel was pumped out of Retro Studios. Two separate worlds, one shadow, one light, where the difference between life and death is a few inches of metal. Metroid Prime 2 Echoes, only for Nintendo GameCube, rated T for Teen. This time, the team decided to make the storyline a bit more in your face than last time by adding three times the amount of cutscenes. And although the majority of games still feel like a typical Metroid game, it has ever so slightly moved away from the typical Metroid storyline as a main focus and gone for a more darker look and feel. Now I mostly prefer the style of the game that came before it, because you know, it's good old typical Metroid. But considering we have covered so many games in this series so far that look like typical Metroid games, I really do appreciate the change up found here. New sounds, new enemies, new landscapes and even new guns. Everything in the game was redesigned this time round, which is why when you put them back to back, even though they obviously use the same engine, they both completely work on their own. Now the difficulty spike in this one is a tad harsher due to some pretty stingy checkpoints and extended playtime. And because of this, it often finds itself not being as loved as the original. Plus, to try and appeal to a larger audience, multiplayer was added for up to four players. Sadly, this is the biggest downfall for the game. Now, granted, I will always choose single player adventure over multiplayer first person shooter games, but even I can see that this game's funky control scheme works flawlessly in single player, and not so much here. I can't help but feel that this was just tacked on to appeal to those I'm never going to shut up about GoldenEye Nintendo fanboys that bought a GameCube, but for me, nah, just nah. Overall, the game isn't as good as the legendary game that came out before it, but it is still good. Just make sure you've got plenty of time on your hands for this one. If you keep at it, it is still fully worth it. Now that's two Metroid Prime games done, and one still to go. But before we move on to that, we got a couple of other games that came up before the jump to the Nintendo Wii. But first, let's take a quick look at the Canadian exclusive commercial for Metroid Prime 2. Yeah. I knew Mike we used to hang out a lot. I was with him the first time he tried it. It was his birthday. I feel like it's my fault. I'm the one who bought it for him. This year, millions of people will lose loved ones to Metroid Prime 2 Echoes, rated T for teen. So, like I said, whilst Retro Studios went to work on Metroid Prime 3, Nintendo was working on not one, but two different titles. 
Firstly, you got this bad boy. Originally starting out as a free multiplayer game for everyone outside of Japan, it eventually became Metroid Prime Hunters. This one is technically very impressive for a Nintendo DS, but it's not for me. There is a single player option and honestly I haven't finished it, it just didn't feel right. Not only do the controls feel strange compared to the original Prime games, it's pretty basic, but then again I suppose that is to be expected. The game got almost completely positive reviews when it was released and with the use of that weird thumbtack control system, <laughs> who else remembers this? You have a first person shooter that works a lot better than you would expect for a handheld. But the biggest draw for this game, again not really for me, was the deathmatch mode. It's not the best deathmatch type game you'll ever play but it is most definitely one of the best for the Nintendo DS for the time. When the system was able to go online playing a game like this with voice chat might I add, was pretty damn mind blowing. It's just such a shame that over 10 years later Nintendo seemed to have taken a step back in this field, but hey that's a topic for another time. Anyway, like I said, the game just isn't my cup of tea. I can understand that it might be for you, and with favourable reviews, I wouldn't put it against you if you was a fan. For me, however, the biggest surprise in the whole Metroid franchise was the other game that was being worked on. You see, after the Mario franchise lost their mind by creating one of the weirdest Mario spin-offs going, Kensuke came up with the idea of making a Metroid Prime pinball game, retelling the original Metroid Prime story, but in pinball form. It sounds stupid and it's easily the least covered game in this entire franchise on the tubes, but surprisingly it's one of the best spin offs I've ever played for the franchise. The game is just so good, I can't exactly put my finger on what it does right over a typical pinball game because in my opinion Super Mario Ball wasn't all that enjoyable. There's just so many cool little elements found here like when Samus changes from a morph ball and shoots a small wave of bad guys from a fixed position, it just works so well. In fact for a game that sold pretty averagely at first, in my opinion, it's one of the systems absolute must own games. If you ever see it, make sure you buy it, you will be incredibly surprised by this Metroid Prime pinball game. Man, that sounds so weird just saying that. Right with those two games over and done with, let's move to the final Prime game shall we? We would like to play. Power of Ultimate Control, Metroid Prime 3 Corruption, only for Wii, rated T for Teen. It's the obvious next step, would I have preferred a GameCube controlled version of the game? Well, actually no, in fact I didn't play this one until after getting the Metroid Prime Trilogy and replaying the first one again, but obviously with the newfangled Wiimote controls. And you know what? I really liked it. It's the same as the Pikmin new controlled style games, they just sussed it out. Playing this, a first person game with motion controls, well it sounds pretty scary, but it really does work. So without a doubt this game up to this point in the Metroid releases is the most cinematic game by a long way, and again the whole atmosphere feels a tad darker than the original, and a bit more techy I suppose. It's a perfect end to a brilliant trilogy, you got characters not only returning from other Prime games but even games going further back than that. Do I prefer it over the original? No, but I'm not really sure why in all honesty, there's nothing wrong with it, I just sort of prefer the classic simplistic feel of the original. However, looking back at reviews of this third game when it came out, I heard on quite a few occasions that people thought it was the very best game in the trilogy. Look, 
I'll leave it up to you guys to decide. The game feels a tad more linear than the last two games, and one of the most notable updates is the ability to use your ship to do some classic worm style airstrikes to your enemies. This is pretty cool because not only do you upgrade yourself, you also upgrade your ship. However, like the Streets of Rage special, you can only use it outside, which sadly seriously limits the amount you can use it. However, when you do, it feels epic. There's loads more to scan in this game if that's your thing, and eventually you can unlock something called Hyper Mode, which is basically close to being an invincibility mode. It affects your health, but most enemies do drop health anyway, so you can get the majority of it back almost all of the time. Look, this isn't supposed to be a full-on review of the game, and after talking about the other Metroid Prime games, you will know by now if the game is right for you or not. If you like the look of these games, then this will be right up your street. My suggestion is to play them in order. They're literally the perfect trilogy, and some of the best games available for both the GameCube and the Wii. And although that Wii trilogy collection has held its original value, it is still fully worth the 40 to 50 quid it currently goes for. Thankfully, you can buy it on the Nintendo eShop slightly cheaper, and the original games are all bloody cheap too. In other words, one of Nintendo's best trilogies of the last couple of generations is going for a fully acceptable price. Get it now before it seriously inflates. In 2015, at E3, during one of Nintendo's first jumps to moving away from their awesome stage shows of yesteryear, announced a brand new Metroid game. To date, the most recent and entirely new game in the franchise. The last one we're going to be looking at here today. I remember being on Skype with my mate Ollie watching this conference as we do every year, getting excited that a new game was arriving, and then very quickly going crazy with anger at exactly what I was watching. Who the hell's idea was this? I don't want this. I want this or even this. What are you doing to us, Nintendo? I'm sure the same thing happened when Nintendo made the Zelda games look like this. So after I calmed down, I remember the last time Nintendo did a crazy spin-off, it actually worked out bloody brilliantly. So let's push all that negativity aside and have a look, shall we? Essentially, what you're looking at is a multiplayer Metroid Prime game. There is a solo mode, but yeah, the fun is really had playing online or via local co-op. Now obviously the game is far more action based than before, but that's sort of what I expected. But what I will say is that I was pleasantly surprised at how many puzzle elements were included. Sure there's not as much, but they are here, and the hidden items you find in the game, which are these mod chips, are used to boost your bounter hunter's abilities. There are quite a few of these scattered about the place, and I really like them because it ends up making the game different every time you play it. Overall, the game is an above average title in the franchise, and sure I went in with very low expectations as did the majority of gamers, and because of this, I feel that Nintendo did actually deliver. It's not the best game, far 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 from it, but it is a good game, it's just a badly timed release. Bring this game out between these bad boys and there wouldn't have been any fuss at all. Well, almost none. And whilst we're on the subject of these two games, that brings me to this. Metroid Prime 4. Nothing more has currently been said about this game, and I'm not going to date this video by going into the vague details that we have on it so far. However, I trust that whatever Nintendo are doing, they will do the right thing and deliver with this one. Be sure to subscribe and keep an eye out because you can be damn sure that I will be reviewing this game fully as and when it comes out. Wow, that was quite the complete history. And honestly, there is still so much to talk about. Obviously with this being a big recognisable Nintendo franchise, they have done the right thing and actually shoved Metroid in your face so much so that even if you've never played one of these games before, you know what Metroid is. Well, sort of. The earliest known cameo was Famicom Wars, and the first two Kid Icarus games even used the same engine as the first two Metroid games and featured these little things that, well, let's be honest, look a little bit like Metroids. She can be seen here when you complete Tetris Game B on the original NES, as well as the beginning of Core 7 in F1 Race. 
There's a galactic pinball game that features Samus's ship on the Virtual Boy, as well as a couple of cameos in the amazing Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. You've got cameos in several Kirby games, Wario Land 2, obviously every Smash Brothers game. You've got Animal Crossing, Geist, Fatal Frame, Donkey Kong Country, Dead or Alive. Pushmo, Nintendo Land, Bayonetta, there's just way too many to talk about in this video. And then of course you've got amiibos, comics, mangas, even more commercials to advertise other things, as well as an insane amount of cameos and references in TV shows and movies. All of this leads to one thing, the Metroid series is huge, one of the most recognisable and cool Nintendo franchises to ever grace gaming. It's genre defining, it's probably the best thing Nintendo have ever made. Well obviously that's up for debate, but it's without a doubt in my top 3. Thank you all so so much for coming on this journey with me. Is this the complete history? Well yes, but not for long. It's guaranteed that Nintendo are going to release more games in the franchise, starting with Metroid Prime 4, but no matter how many more games they pump out, I welcome them all. Even the bad games are average at worst, leaving us with a franchise that is pretty much solid no matter where you start off. So what are you waiting for? Get yourself suited up and play any of the no doubt many Metroid games that may be sitting in your backlog. Guaranteed, you're gonna have a good time. Hey there guys, thank you all so so much for checking out the Metroid Complete History video. This has been an absolute mammoth task, easily over 100 hours working on this one. If you have made it this far into the video then please go check out my top comment and give me a high five underneath so I know you made it. I know it's been a little while since I've done my complete history and now, well you know what I've been working on. I have a few more complete histories coming up, two Sega related ones over the next two or three weeks, so make sure you subscribe so you get notified when they're released. However, this is the part of the video where I give my usual big big shout out to my Patreons, with a special shout out going to Matthew Ritter, Ryan Burford, Phil Lowell, Lindsay, and A. Chapman, Pop Goes Rock Band, Gavin Gora Vibbertson, Creamy Elephant, James Loveridge, Casey Garner, Blitz Hedgy, Ben Hall, Taylor Armand, Sin Killer, Jay Takakawa, and of course, Tiago Piera Dos Santos Silva. If you want to be part of my list, then get your name shouted out, get your name shown, see what I'm working on, see the making of this video as I made it, as well as crazy amounts of other stuff, as well as being part of my monthly Q&A, then please click the link that you see on the screen. Don't forget to subscribe, give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down, whatever you prefer. And if you're one of those people to keep sharing my content in places like Reddit, then a massive thumbs up to you. It really does help the channel. But for now, this is DJ Slope signing out, and hopefully, I'll see you all next time.